Hi, this is Justin and welcome to Simple Believer TV. This channel is for those who desire to better understand who God is, who they are to God, and how to walk out this Christian life. I'm here to simplify the scriptures to better help you run the race that God has called you to run. So thank you for being a part of this community. Thank you for subscribing. Enjoy today's teaching. Um, but good morning again to everybody and happy Palm Sunday. I'm excited to share uh, just some of the thoughts that I've been studying. Um, it's actually one of my favorite uh messages to put together is Palm Sunday because of so many of the um, hidden messages behind God uh, orchestrating uh, Jesus's journey to the cross. Uh, and so the title of my message this morning for those who are taking notes is our true king was our worthy lamb. Our true king was a worthy lamb. It's hard to see both of those connections made in anybody else's life and nobody was like our king but he was also our worthy lamb and today we celebrate and we remember uh, what is known as palm sunday and there's two questions that i really want to answer um, historically that has taken place is why did god choose this particular day for jesus to ride in jerusalem I want you to think about that question because uh, when we understand it, and maybe you guys have done your own studies and you've come to your own understandings of why this day was chosen, but it's extremely uh, significant. And the way that a sovereign God could orchestrate this is remarkable. Uh, the second question is, was it just a random day or did it have a specific meaning to the Jewish culture of that day? Uh, so this day marks that we are literally five days away from Jesus being crucified and the Passover being celebrated. Uh, and we're just seven days away from the most significant event in our heritage, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to picture with me for a moment, if you can, uh, with your imagination, picture this moment back in the day, try to put yourself in the shoes or the sandals of a Jewish person back in the day um, that these crowds were gathered. Think of probably the most crowded place you've ever been to on foot traffic. And you probably can get a very good picture of what this day would have been like when it comes to uh, rubbing shoulders with thousands upon thousands. Historians even say millions of people were present uh, in this community on Palm Sunday. Um, they say it's estimated up to two and a half million people. So uh, the place was overflowed from walls uh, spilling out of the gates, people lining up on the hillsides, uh, being tented up. They were ready to do what customarily was done in the Jewish culture at this time. They're literally, if you can imagine for a moment, there was no room left in this jammed city of Jerusalem. Um, just like it was similar to that of the birth of Jesus Christ. Um, and through this crowd consistently streaming into Jer Jerusalem, the disciples entered a village and they found exactly what Jesus Christ had said that they would find that was spoken of in the scriptures. Um, before we look at a verse in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, I thought this was extremely intriguing Jewish historians cite that the lambs during that time all came from Bethlehem. Now think about this. This day that we're talking about Palm Sunday was also known as Lamb Selection Day to the Jewish culture. And every lamb that was being brought came from Bethlehem and they were brought into Jerusalem through the what is called the sheep gate and at that time only the sheep from bethlehem that had been raised especially for this purpose of sacrificing them were allowed to be used for the selection and isn't it interesting that jesus entered jerusalem along with all the other passover lambs 
through the same sheep gate uh, in Jerusalem. And I think you begin to understand the significance of how all of these things come together. If you have your Bibles or if you're reading along with me, look at Zechariah chapter 9, verse number 9. This is spoken by the prophet uh, nearly 1,400 years before this day, and it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and he has salvation. He is lowly and he's riding on a donkey, a colt, a foil of the donkey. Now, this was spoken of many years before this event takes place. So you can imagine some people making some connections at this point, remembering what Zechariah said in chapter 9, verse 9, that behold, your king is coming. He is just and he has salvation with him. He is lowly and he's riding on a donkey or a colt. And that brings us up into John chapter 12. If you have your Bibles, look at John chapter 12. I want to give you a little bit of a context of the verses that I'm not going to read. In John chapter 11, this is where Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. This is a, one of the most historic big miracles that he did. The crowd, um, many of the Pharisees followed Jesus simply because of what took place. They couldn't deny the fact that he was dead for a couple days and now he was alive. Uh, many wanted to come and were just trying to find a way to come and see truly if this was the case. So they heard about Lazarus being raised from the dead. And so many were following Jesus at this time. Many who were on the fence actually began to believe that Jesus is the coming Messiah uh, and that he's the one that's going to come and deliver them um, from Rome. And so there is a, a, a huge uproar that was already taking place prior to this day. And so the day prior to him entering into the city, um, there was a lady that came by and poured one pound of expenses, expensive perfume onto his feet. And it's just amazing how God used a lady like this that was looked down upon in society, uh, but she was preparing Jesus without even knowing it for uh, what he was about to encounter. We see... Um, Judas look at the woman and says, man, can you imagine this perfume could actually have been sold and we could have given the money to the poor? Um, and so I think we find even in that story, our own religious hearts and how we judge certain things because of what we maybe are presently going through. The Bible says that he was a thief at that time. He was stealing from the treasury. Uh, so a lot of significance was taking place up into this arrival of Jesus finding a donkey and riding into Jerusalem. And so we pick up in John chapter 12, John chapter 12, and we're going to look at verse number 12. And it says this in verse number 12, in the next day, a great multitude that had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So when you hear great multitude, I want you to think millions of people are coming to the Passover. I mean, there, this is nothing like it. If you ever seen a picture of Muslims going to Mecca, you would have a very good understanding of what this could look like. I remember I was in Uganda at the time and we were flying home back to the States and it was literally the week before everybody migrated to Mecca and it was thousands upon thousands laid out in the airport on the floors with their entire family, all their luggage ready to get on these planes to go to Mecca. And so uh, the picture is just a throng of people. Verse 13 says this, and they took out something very similar to this. They took out palm tree branches and they went out to meet him, and they cried out in these words, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes 
in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So now thou hundreds of thousands of people are welcoming Jesus on this donkey and they're shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. So in their understanding at this point, they're hoping that this Jesus figure is the king that's going to set them free from the rule in the reign of Rome. And they're getting ready to prepare their heart for a brand new king and a brand new kingdom. Uh, and so what does a palm branch, why is a palm branch so significant? And just spare me for a moment if you've heard this before, you understand what I'm sharing, but I really want to communicate this for those who maybe have never heard it. This was, in essence, a royal carpet treatment. If you've ever seen a red carpet rolled out, this is what palm branches represent. Uh, they were a symbol of victory, and they were a symbol of triumph. And it is in that context uh, it was common that people waved palm branches when a king came back from war victorious. They would shout and they would wave their palm branches celebrating the victory of the king or the army at that time. Um, and so they were welcoming Jesus as this great conqueror, as their almighty deliverer. But this is where they missed it. They missed it. And I think we miss it at times too when it comes to our own life. We celebrate Jesus, what he can do for us, change our circumstances, heal our bodies, set us free, prosper us, all those things that we long for. But they miss that he was actually coming to save them from their sin, not just save them from Rome. That's significant. That when they had this understanding that the king is coming to deliver me from Rome, in fact, he was coming to deliver them from themselves and from their sin. The word Hosanna that they were shouting, that means in Hebrew to deliver or to save us now. It is used as a cry of acclamation and adoration. And they wanted to be free from this ruling hand of the government. They, they no longer wanted to be oppressed. They no longer wanted to be a second tier people. And so they were so excited that, man, Jesus is coming to set them free. And I think it's interesting how that plays such a significant role and often how we see God and what we hope God will do for us. But as I mentioned before, this, this triumphal entry of Jesus, it occurred on what we call Palm Sunday. And what I love about this is that it falls on the Jewish calendar, which is the 10th day of Nisan or Nisan. And Jeru Jesus hits Jerusalem on this pinpoint day that was prescribed or predestined many, many, many thousands of years ago. And Jesus came on the very day and the very hour that God had appointed to a precise prophecy that was recorded in Daniel. And so on this date of Nisan 10, for early Jews, this day was known as Lamb Selection Day. Now, I hope that you don't just see all this information I'm sharing with you as just historic rubbish, but actually you, you can see the connections of a divine God who's a personal God who was fulfilling prophecy to deliver his people who he wanted a relationship with. And just to make sure that we didn't miss all these connections, God sent his son to Jerusalem on the same day that the Jewish people had been selecting their lambs for the past 1500 years. Can you imagine how he set this up so that the Jewish people could see that their savior and their king is in the person of Jesus Christ? A historian named Josephus uh, of the first century, he tells us this, that at that time, think about this, guys, 255,000 lambs were sacrificed for the number of pilgrims 
in Jerusalem because it was one lamb per family up to 10 could partake of this sacrifice. So get this picture, 250,000 lambs being slaughtered. That was a bloodbath. That was like the logistics of a lamb per family being sacrificed for their sins. That means close to two, over 2 million people were present at this time. And it's a reminder of the people when it's lamb selection day, they're reminding of what God did for the people of Israel in Egypt when he passed over the houses that contained blood on their doorposts. That comes from uh, Exodus 12, 3 and 6. I'm going to read it for you. It says, speak to all the congregation of Israel saying, on the 10th of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb according to the house of his father and a lamb for a household. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day. Think about this. They go select the lamb, the 10th day, and they prepare that lamb for four days. And on the 14th day, and I just want to re readjust what I said. On that 10th day, they get the lamb. For four days, they live with the lamb. It's a relational process. And then they have to sacrifice the lamb on the 14th, the same day that Jesus was sacrificed. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of the Israel shall kill it at twilight. And I just want to remind us all that Jesus not only is our true king, but he's also our Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, it says these words, Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, since you are truly are unleavened or clean. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. And the Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, which means to pass or to hover over something. And only for those households in Egypt that had the door um, of the Passover lamb of the blood that was applied to those doorposts. So in translation, Jesus is the living fulfillment of every legal requirement of God's righteous standard. He was the Passover lamb, the lamb that God had chosen so that you and I could be set free from the wrath which is to come from the sin that had us bound back into a restored relationship with the Father. It's amazing news. And this day sets up the, the whole scenario in a perfect way for us to see Jesus as the Passover lamb. Uh, if you make the connection, stay in John chapter 12, but the story is detailed also in Luke 19. And it says this in verse 39 and 40. And some of the Pharisees called to him from the crowd, teacher, rebuke your disciples. This is what they're shouting at Jesus. And verse 440 says this, but he answered and said to them, I tell you, if even these guys would keep silent, the stones would immediately cry out. Why did he say that statement? Have you ever wondered why he made that statement? Why did Jesus mention stones? What would that have meant to the crowd of the people and to the Pharisees? Now think about this. Jesus had started this journey on this donkey at the entry or the east of the Jordan River. And he crossed the Jordan River on that day, which is Nisan, the 10th day, which is Palm Sunday. And in Joshua 4.19 the children of Israel crossed the Jordan into the promised land. Guess what day? The 10th of Nisan. Oh my gosh, can you, can you just make all these connections are absolutely 
pointing us toward the glory of the Father and the sovereignty of God is that when the children of Israel crossed over the Jordan, they crossed over on the 10th of Nisan. That was historically what was taught to generation after generation after generation. And Jesus said, even these stones that I just crossed over, they will cry out and uh, uh, worship me if I tell others not to. So it's important to note as you may or may not know, at the beginning of Jesus's ministry, he avoided recognition. He avoided publicity. He would tell people, don't say anything. Don't tell people what I have done. He wanted to remain uh, silent. He wanted to remain hidden for a time. But now, look at this. He came near because it was his father's will. You see, there was nothing within him that wanted publicity or fame until it was the will of God. And he knew that the moment that he entered into this day and entered into the celebration, that it was the beginning of an end for him. And he proceeded out of duty. He did what he did because he was obeying the father. And he knows that he was going to be celebrated Although he was never looking for that recognition, he simply came to be in line with the will of his father. And I think that's something that we all can glean from and to learn. So Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was the obedient thing for him to do. And he knew what was truly in store for him. He knew behind all of this applause and all of this celebration was a suffering that was to come. And I just wonder, have you ever felt like obeying God was difficult? Have you ever known that you are to do what God said to do, but it wasn't going to translate into something good at the end? That's hard for us sometimes is to do what we know God is putting in our hearts, but it's not going to play out as nicely as that we would hope. And so sometimes we don't do that. We don't obey God because we don't want to suffer or we don't want to go through challenges or a difficult time. But I want to encourage all of us today, obedience to God is always worth it. No matter what's on the other side of the door, no matter if you don't know what's on the other side of the door, or even if you do, obey the Lord. Don't wiggle out of trying to obey him, just trust that wherever he's leading you is for the glory and the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so on this day, there is an energy, there's an expectation, there is a hope that soon Jesus would finally take over and they, he would be their king for good. And no longer would they be under the rule of the Roman Empire. But there is a greater purpose church for this day. This is an opportunity that God was given them and he's given to us to recognize and to celebrate the true purpose for Christ's coming. That it was not to build a kingdom on this earth, but a kingdom that would be placed within every heart of every man that would receive Jesus Christ. It's a kingdom that would transform us into his redeemed sons and his redeemed daughters that no longer lived for this life, that we no longer held tightly onto what we could get and what we could achieve on this life, but we were truly storing up treasures in the life to come and that we would live with eternity on our eyelids and that we would live knowing that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. And those rewards may not happen on this side of this eternity, but they will happen on the other side of eternity that obeying God and living for him is Christ came to set us free so that we could do so. And I find this to be extremely interesting. I've made this mistake. I'm not saying that we shouldn't continue to use this verse, but there's a verse that was used on this specific day collectively as a people. And I personally have taken this as a personal verse. I have used it almost every single day of my life. Um, but I must not forget that there's a greater context of this verse. And it comes from Psalms 118, verse 24 through 26. And this was something that they prayed collectively. 
I want you to hear these words maybe for the first time in a new way. This is the day of the Lord, or this is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it always. How many have ever shared that or said that verse? Where you wake up in the morning, you go, this is the day that the Lord has made. You've probably heard me share that from the pulpit many times. This is the day, but the day that they this is referring to is this day. Today. Not just tomorrow, not yesterday. Today. It's, it's the day of Palm Sunday of Lambs. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad. Why? Because the king has entered onto a donkey. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. They are declaring this from Jerusalem. This is a prayer that the Jewish people collectively play, prayed on this day. Save now, I pray, O Lord. O Lord, I pray, send now prosperity. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. As I finish up with the, the details of this story in John chapter 12, verse 14 and 15, it says, then Jesus, when he had found a young donkey, he sat on it as it is written, fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey. And what I love about the symbolism here is that the donkey or the colt, it represents the true sim, uh, concept of Christ and what he symbolized by riding on this donkey. In ancient days, as you may have come to understand, a colt was a noble animal. It was used as a service to carry things that were burdens of men. But more significantly, it was used by kings and when they had entered into a city in peace, they rode on a colt to symbolize, symbolize their peaceful intentions. And that's different from a conquering king. A conquering king, when he comes home from battle, he always rides on a horse. And Jesus, of course, is coming back on a horse. Amen. But he rode on a donkey that day. And why? because he was signifying peace. And each person that's hearing my voice this morning, and maybe we'll hear it on a recording later on, Jesus came to make peace between you and the Father. Church, there's nothing between you and the Father. I know you have your struggles. I know you have the weights that carry or weigh you down. And I know that you may see the father in a way that maybe he isn't rightly seen. But Jesus came to make peace between humanity, unrighteous, unholy, imperfect humanity, peace between a holy, righteous, and perfect God. There is now peace. There is no more, the Bible says, no more enmity between us and the father. That those who are far away, he has brought close. And has restored to us a relationship with the Father, just as Jesus' relationship to the Father as well. And I find many struggle to enjoy it, to receive it, to put their faith in this thing that Jesus has done for us. He is the Passover lamb. And so as they got their lambs ready, they lived with their lambs for four days, as they were going to sacrifice the lamb, they knew I put my faith in the lamb of God or the lamb that is sacrificed for our sins. So the father can look at his household and say, we are forgiven and we have been restored into a peaceful relationship with God. And the good news is Jesus is that lamb, but he was an eternal once and for all sacrifice, never to be sacrificed again, so that he could perfect those who are being sanctified, which is us. And now we can come boldly to the throne of grace, and we can enter in by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know you know these things. I know many of you have heard these things before, but I pray that we'll just be reminded of some things that are extremely significant. 
God knows what you're going through. If he can plan for thousands of years, one significant day with one cult and Jesus and make it on the same day that happened in Joshua 4 and now it happened on Palm Sunday, he knows what you're going through. He knows where he's taking you. He knows how to get you to where you are, to where he is bringing you to. You never have to be concerned if God is unaware of your pain, of your struggle, of what you're going through. You never have to be unaware of God knowing that on the other side of obedience at times is great sacrifice and suffering. There are people that I know that had to quit their jobs based upon an ethics issue because God says it's time to get out of this environment. And that job was making them great money, but yet they obeyed God and it led to a challenging season. And yet they would always come out and say, it's worth it to obey God. People that have stood up for what God has put inside their hearts to only be persecuted for their faith or for their stance, they would come out and say, it is worth it to obey God. And I just want to encourage you that it's worth it to be sons of obedience, to look at what the Lord is asking of us and to stand upon that which is true, to stand upon his word and to stand upon that which he is asking each of us to do. I want to finish off with what this day represents. First, this day represents the finishing of the work that Christ came to do. Church, he finished the work he came to do. He was tasked to live a perfect life, to die for humanity, to take our place so that we could have a relationship with God. And this day represents that he was about to finish the work that he came to do. The second thing that this day represents it is an establishment of a new kingdom, a new dispensation of grace, and a new way that we can approach and relate to the Father. We have the kingdom of God that lives within us. It doesn't live in a church. It doesn't live in a temple. We have the kingdom of God that dwells within us by the Holy Spirit of God, which is a guarantee that Jesus is coming back for us as a church. The third thing that this day represents is that our great king became a worthy, humble lamb for us so that when God looks at us, he measures us based upon the lamb, not based upon us. When God justifies us, it's because he's looked upon the worthiness of the lamb. This new covenant that we have is not based upon us. And whether we fix our shortcomings, it's based upon the perfection of the Lamb of God. The question in the Old Testament was, where is the Lamb? John the Baptist said, behold the Lamb of God. And John the Apostle said, worthy is the Lamb of God that was slain before the foundation of the world. The fourth thing that this day represents to all of us is that our Savior, he chose to follow even though it led to suffering. He chose to follow. He knew what was in store. He knew he was about to be whipped and beaten and crucified, and yet he continued to ride in that direction. And lastly, New Day, this day represents how we can easily miss God's heart, God's plan, and God's intentions because we see what we're going through in a selfish way. Oh God, why me? Oh God, why did you allow this to happen? Oh God, my life sucks. Oh God, my life is so hard. Not realizing that we could so easily miss God's heart, God's plan, and God's intention in the midst of that pain. I don't know what you're going through, but I beg you to ask that question that I've been saying to ask for the last number of years. God, who do you want to be for me right now that you couldn't be for me at any other moment in life? And it's in that answer that you find rest. It's in who he is to you that you find peace and that you find joy. And so let us not easily miss God's heart and his plan as intentions and what he's calling us to do, where he's leading us 
and the things that he's asking of us to obey because it's in that obedience that we find what he truly has for all of us. Our true king was a humble lamb and he will return as our king because he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords and every name will bow to who our king is. Let us pray. Father, I pray that somehow I was able to deliver your words to your people this morning. And I pray, Father God, that I was able to communicate your heart and the worthiness of obedience to who you are. Father, I bless you today. And I thank you so much that your presence is with us today. I pray that your word would fill our heart with joy. And that as we remember this day called Pass or uh, Palm Sunday, that we would be reminded of the significance of you, our king, riding on a cult, a colt, a donkey, to fulfill the prophecies that were spoken long ago, so that we ultimately could have a relationship with you. Father, I pray that you give strength to those who are ready to quit and ready to give in. I pray that you restore hope to the hopeless. And Father, I pray for those who are scared to obey you, that you would give them courage to take the step that you're asking them to take. But most of all, Father, we bless you and we honor you. We love you and we adore you. Jesus, thank you for obeying the Father. Thank you for dying for us and going to the cross. And Holy Spirit, thank you for ministering to us God's love and helping us understand and see the realities of the gospel and the cross. We receive it today. We enjoy